This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This week in Parasitism, episode number 74, recorded on July 2nd, 2014. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommiers. Hello Vincent. What's with the eyebrows going up and down? I don't know. You're playing around? No, no, I might have seen a Groucho Marx movie last night or something, perhaps, I don't know. Let me adjust my... I just decided here. to uh, in throw a, in something different for a change. Are you in a jocular mood for jocular, once? A jocular, that's a good term. Yeah, I feel jocular. You went fishing yesterday. I did. Did you learn anything about ecology? Always. You can never not learn anything if you go fishing. You always see things differently every time you go. I don't know. I think a lot of people who fish don't learn anything. Yeah, well, then maybe if they just sit on the end of the dock with a... Cane pole on a bobber. Sitting on the dock of the bay watching yeah, the time that's right. pass away. That's right. Who sang that? Otis Redding. <laughs> exactly. I know a few songs. You not do. too many. You do. You're good. You're good. No, I was in Montana. Yes. Who, who wrote and you didn't fish. the song, <laughs> Moving to Montana Soon? I have no concept. It's Frank Zappa. See, that? that's not my era. It's your era. Frank Zappa didn't come up on my radar screen until much later in my life. <clears throat> Although I'm sorry that that happened that way, that's just the way it is. So you use, uh, I was more of a jazz excuses. person, more of a jazz person. And and why, the reason I'm saying this is because I was just in Montana right. last week. Right. So uh, Vincent, what's the weather like outside? <laughs> so moving to Montana. Yeah. It's actually just called Montana. Right. It is. It features Tina Turner and the I Cats backing, Tina Turner, backing really? vocals. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Yeah. Wow. Montana's a great state. I'm plucking the old dental floss. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in Montana. Really? Especially where you were, Hamilton. Yeah, but I wasn't there for the same reason. There's a wonderful river that runs through it. As There's a river say. that runs through the it, the bitter, bitter root. root. The bitter root. Bitter root. Bitter root. Yeah. Well, today, Good stuff. on TWIP... Yes. We're back to malaria. We are. I think we've done more malaria episodes than well, any other. If it goes away, we'll start doing it on something else, but it's still one of the big health problems that we face. My son asked me yesterday if there's any malaria in the U.S., and I said no. There's no autochthonous malaria. But there's imported malaria. Yeah. Every now and then, though, there is, there is some autochthonous malaria. It springs up every now and then, usually in the late summer. As a result of some traveler coming back with the form of malaria that can relapse. Yeah, it's inevitable. Yeah, so that's like Plasmonium vivax. So they go to a hospital. No, no, they don't get sick. And so they get bitten by mosquitoes, and the mosquitoes pick it up locally. Mm -hmm. And they start distributing it among the people that live in the area. And you know what actually snuffs out the epidemic? What? Winter. So that's not autochthonous because it's... No, that is autochthonous. That would be autochthonous. Yeah. And every now and then we do have autochthonous cases, but mostly it's traveling to countries that have malaria. You either do or do not take your anti-malarials. You come back, you're infected, you get sick, you come to a hospital, you get recorded. And they count, mm -hmm. they count that as traveler's malaria. <clears throat> it's a big deal, actually. How many of those the, cases are there in the U.S. every year? Uh, well, it varies, but I guess we could go look it up. The CDC has a record of all of this, and uh, we can. I love having the computer right here because we can, <laughs> we can at least make a fewer number of mistakes than we would have if we hadn't had the computer in front of us. Every year, one thousand five hundred cases of malaria are That's diagnosed in the lot. U.S. That's a lot, mostly in returned travelers. Exactly. Travelers to sub-Saharan Africa have the greatest risk of getting malaria and that? dying from their infection. How about that? So, what just happened recently that we were riveted to our television screens? Watching? I wasn't. Yeah, but uh, somebody else was. The World Cup. Yeah, and what about the World Cup? It's in Brazil. Yeah, where in Brazil? I don't know where it's hot. I know it's, <laughs> it's <only> really hot. <laughs> yeah, but that's it, isn't it all it, over Brazil? It, yeah, it is all over Brazil. And one of the venues was Manaus. Uh huh. 
Well, let's see. Where is of that. Manaus? I don't know. Oh, you can go to the videotape and find out. Manaus is at the junction of two major rivers that form the main uh, Amazon. River. Wow, look at this. This is a pretty big river area. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, and it's yeah. pretty wild. It's huh. wild enough to have malaria transmission almost all year long. There's a lot of water in this area. So guess what? Hmm. The World Cup was held, in is Manaus. being held in Manaus. Uh, and everybody in the audience, and when is it held in Manaus? At night, when it's cooler. Right now, though, it's not summer down there. Uh, well, it's on the equator. It's probably always summer. <laughs> oh, yeah. <clears throat> the point is that what I'm driving at here, Vincent, is that all of the audience and the players were susceptible to contracting malaria. And one of the announcers mm. actually said, the United States did play a match there. And they said they might be a little lethargic given the fact that they might have been kept up all night because of the nightmares they were getting from their anti-malarial drugs. <laughs> yeah. Brazil is a big chunk of South America. Brazil, you know how big Brazil is? It's as much land as we need to feed people for the next it's, 50 it's years, It's bigger right? than the United States, minus Alaska. Bigger than the continental United States. How big is Australia? That's a, I don't know. Let's go look it up. That's, Why would I have to guess that? <laughs> that's because I'm going there Friday. Yeah, that's true. That's a long plane flight. A long, long plane flight. I, I am not looking forward to that plane flight. I think flight. you should edit this out of this conversation. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because... How would you like to be the inviter to hear no, that no, your invitee no, no, says, I'm not looking forward to going? You know? I'm looking forward to mingling <laughs> with the Australians, of for sure. It'll be great. Some wonderful people. It's just a very long plane flight. But I don't know what I'm going to do for 18 hours between lax and sleep, Melbourne. watch movies, listen to your Frank Zappa. You can do a whole bunch of things. All of that assumes that I download all this stuff onto my Why computer not? before I go. Yeah, but you can do that. Yeah. You should carry your tunes with you, Vince. You should do that. No, they're all in the cloud, Dixon. Well, then that's too bad for you because <laughs> you're going to be in the clouds. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? You're going to be in the clouds actually, and you can't? Actually, they probably have internet on the plane because the, uh, the plane I took from Denver to yeah, yeah. Newark on Saturday had internet. Yeah, well... I think Qantas probably has I'm not it. flying Qantas. How or many United, times do I have to tell you? United. I only fly United. Okay, fine. Today's paper yes. is about malaria. You picked it. It's from Science. Did. Science, right. by the way, has changed their Format. formatting. Yeah, totally. Totally. I'm not sure I like it. You know, I don't care. Because <laughs> you don't read it. <laughs> well, I do read, but I don't care. Yeah, it got a little bit more newsy. A little bit more glitzy than it used to be. Three column format. I know. M different fonts all over uh, the place. The illustrations are all. Somebody bit was different. just having a field day redesigning. Perhaps. You know. Perhaps. Yeah. Every, the title every of this then. paper is "Antibodies to PFSEA-1," which is a protein. Yes, Block it is. parasite egress from RBCs. What does RBC stand for? A red blood cell. So why don't you ask me what PFSEA stands Hold for? Hold on, we'll get to that. And protect against malaria infection. Yes. In the same sentence, antibodies protecting against infection. And against a specific stage of the infection. But you can't use antibodies to, to do therapy, can you? Well, it's been done in the past. Yeah, but you're not going to give everybody in the world who's susceptible to malaria no. antibodies, you are won't. you? You won't, but you can now discern what the antigen is. Ah. And if you do that, you might be able to develop a vaccine based on that concept. Okay. And, in fact, they have some interesting stats here in the beginning. By That's the way, right. yes. the first author, there are a lot of authors. On There's a lot of authors. first authors. author is Deepak Raj. Yep. The last, the last author is Jonathan Curtis, K-U-R-T-I-S. Correct. And they're from... Brown University. Brown University, uh, Harvard Medical School. Yep. What else? NIH. Yeah, they're the all Fred over Hutch the place. They're from in Washington. Um, the National Institutes of Health. They had a lot of help with this because it's a big topic. And uh, every Plasmodium. time you discover something, there's a database out there that somebody else has got, so you can take advantage of it. Plasmodium falciparum malaria kills up to a million children in sub-Saharan Africa each That's right. year. We've said that every time we've talked about malaria. There are about 100 okay. vaccine candidates. Now, um, that's remarkable. Con but, currently under investigation. But it says they're only based on four parasite antigens. More than 60% of them. Yeah. Is that good? Not really. Well, if they're the right antigens, it's fine. Oh, well, yes. But no. since we don't know which one is going to work. That's right, exactly right. So, so they're saying we need new strategies, okay? And that's what this paper is about. Correct. There must be other Achilles heels that this parasite presents to the host. 
Is that where you get bitten by a mosquito? And you know what? This is a great paper for several reasons. One is that it does identify a certain protein from a certain stage of the parasite, which actually works. And it cuts across all species, and um, it even af affects the outcome of a mouse malaria because this is a shared antigen that all these species of human uh, susceptible malarias um, possess. But also, what I think is great about this paper is that it went into the field and they looked for little kids, two years old, susceptible and less susceptible to the clinical effects of malaria. Correct. And when they did that, and they analyzed the antibody patterns that recognized the antigens in, in this case, Plasmodium falciparum, they found a difference. And they looked for those differences, and they based their whole search for proteins on whether or not person who was infected was either very sick or not so sick. And I think that's a great way to start because, let's face it, you're not going to probably get a vaccine that would prevent infection. But you could have a vaccine which modifies the pathology. And this looks like it's one of those candidates. And that's why I was particularly turned on by the topic. So they say that in endemic areas, there are always people who develop right. immunity that's right. And don't get sick. That's right. That's so like, as you said, sure. they wanted to say what's in their blood versus people who get exactly sick. Exactly right. So the people working on HIV AIDS have the same dilemma, and they solved their dilemma in the same way. They looked for non-susceptible people who were exposed again and again to the HIV virus. Now, and it's sadly, an older, those, are, those are very rare. and Extremely rare. Extremely it, it, rare. It involves the lack of a receptor but gene. But you know what? Which, HIV infection in humans is extremely rare compared to malaria infections in humans. So it's a lot easier to find people that are less affected by malaria than it would be ever to find people who are less affected by HIV. So there, there are many reasons why people are not made ill by HIV infection. One of them is if you're not... If you don't have the one of the co-receptors, right, and that observation is being used to develop therapies, sure, to delete the gene from people. And Not another easy. is that some make antibodies which some make protect good antibodies, and That's others, right. they're called elite controllers. Yeah, they apparently right. have good ways of developing cellular immunity against the virus. So we that? can learn from. Looking at infected people These are or not infected nature's people. Nature's nuance. It's all out there. We should just look at it. That's you know what? Remember when I talked about this in another context that I said nature has all the answers. What's your question? Did you say that? I did. Should we make that the episode title? <laughs> no, because actually Howard Odom said that first and I, I'm fond of quoting Howard Odom. Who's Howard Odom? Odom. Odom. He's the brother of Eugene Odom. Two together were great. Uh, systems ecologists. Hmm. And Howard Odom ended up his career at the uh, University of Florida, which, as you know, uh, one of our co-hosts for TWIV. In Gainesville? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I gave a talk down there, and I actually used this quote in my talk, and someone up came up to me afterwards and says, thank you for remembering Howard Odom. Howard Odom was a genius. He was a mathematical... Did he really say that? He did. So because of that, we can't use it as a title? We could use it as a title. We have no qualms about using anything for a title, as long as you give credit. What is it? Nature has all your answers. What is your question? Nature has all the answers. What is your question? Yeah, that's cool, but it doesn't tell us that this is a malaria episode. But no, it doesn't. But in this case, the don't. question is, why are these people less affected by malaria? That's the question. And they found the answer. I think the title should be Schizont No Exit. You know there's a very famous play <laughs> oh, good. called No Exit? Yeah. You, are you aware of that, or is that not your era? Who uh, wrote that play? What? Is that a Bertolt Brecht play or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> something obscure that only Vincent Racaniello's family knows about? Jean-Paul Sartre. Oh, you see? Well, it's an nihilist. existentialist. A nihilist. Yeah, it's an existentialist. French no play. exit, no exit. Um, cool. In French, it would be huis clos. And, uh, I put think the French title there. Put the French title. Huis clos. Sure. But nobody will know what it means. Yes, they will. We now don't have they, any French if listeners. If they listen to this episode, they will know exactly we what We don't have French listeners. I bet you're wrong. Yeah, I was You know what you're going to hear from? You're going to hear from well, I'm trying to provoke listeners. a little response. <laughs> 
for sure. <laughs> sure, why not? Our one French listener. Uh, no, 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 French speakers, because they well, could be they from to, they could just Newfoundland. Type it into Google you Translate. You could be from Cameroons. You could be from Cote d'Ivoire. You could be from uh, Haiti. Haiti. Where else? Oh, lots of other places. French Polynesia. What's the island uh, that got chikungunya? Réunion. A Réunion. That's a city. That's a city, yeah. And what's the city. island where Réunion is? That's a good question. It, all that's all you're going to say? That's a good question? <laughs> I don't know the answer. <laughs> you ask me lots of questions to which I know no answers. You know, it's and, very funny. And when I give you the wrong it's answer, an island. I become is, the butt of everyone's joke on the internet. So Réunion is a French island. And where is it? It's near, it's east of Madagascar. Do you oh, know where right. that is? I do. Yes, it's east of Africa, right? Yes, I know where that is. And here in New York City, when you search Google for Réunion, you get Réunion Surf Bar. <laughs> a surf bar located in Hell's Kitchen. All right. It's named after the small volcanic island off the coast of Africa. How about that? Should we go? Is it near the Seychelles? Should we go to Réunion? Is it near the Seychelles? No, it's on 44th and 9th. <laughs> That's not such a long trip on a volcanic island. Oh my God. I think the Seychelles are f far from Madagascar, aren't they? Not really. Far? Well, then this is close. Anyway, we digress, Dixon. We you're, do. you're really bad. No, 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 no. This is fun stuff. This is why we do this. So they you basically. Know, this is not only fun to listen to, it's fun to record it. How's that? Rich cord it? To record it. It's fun oh, to record I'm sorry. it. Sorry. Stop. Rich cord it. I'm I thinking. had a small flaw in my speech pattern, and he <laughs> tends to pick up on these things all Jeez. the time. So they pick two year old kids yeah, they because did. they found that at that point, yeah. they, you already get resistance. Why are two year old kids important? Because they say, yeah, no, we no, selected no, no, two year olds because yeah, I know in our that, cohort, show you why. resistance is first detected at this age. And this is a cohort, by the way, from Tanzania. Do you know where that is? No, it's from Tanzania. Tanzania? Yeah, Tanzania. I've been saying it Tanzania I my know, whole life. It's exactly wrong. It's a New Jersey gauche, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's left. New Jersey, New Jersey left. <laughs> Tanzania? As long as we're using French, we should do it right. Is it Tanzania. like Melbourne? Yeah, that's the, that's the correct Melbourne. Yeah. Melbourne. And I'm going to Geelong. Ah, oh, you're going to have a great time. Because I, I pronounced it Geelong, and, no, 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 and no, no. there was an Australian scientist right. at the Hamilton. She said it's that's actually right. Geelong. You're going to see kangaroos, Vincent, Where, in Geelong? the wild. Do you you're know what Geelong is? Yeah, yeah. Where? Yeah. I spent six months in Melbourne. Did you go to Geelong? I did. Oh, I also went to Ballarat. You want to go to Ballarat? No. No, don't go to Ballarat. I just want to go to sleep. It's tiring me to think about it. <laughs> I want to trip. show you something in why this. Why Tanzania? Why Tanzania? No, why two-year-olds? Why two-year-olds? I'm going to show you right now. He's paging through uh, He's his paging book, through which his he book. pages yeah, with loving to. touches. Right, Dixon? That's why. Oh, dear. So Be let's talk about malaria. So you're showing me a graph of antibody levels That's right. with and, age. And, and mortality, too. you got a peak of death at two years of you age. You do, you do, you do. And what is that from? Do you think? So let's just talk a minute about the life cycle. No. <laughs> okay, we've done that already. Yeah, we can talk about it, of course. No, but what I want you to realize is that when a baby is born in an endemic area mm -hmm. like Tanzania, they inherit something from their mother. Yeah, antibodies, right? That's right. Well, not through ge their genetics. They are given this from their mother. Yeah, it comes They're through the placenta, Passively right? transferred, right? right? And so for the first six months of their life, they're protected. Correct. Then what happens? Ah, then they start to get infected. It drops, the levels drop. So if we could even determine what the mother's antibodies were against that protected the infant from initial infection, we would have a clue as to what these antigens really were. Not every mother is going to give protective antibodies, though. It will. The death rate from zero to six months in endemic areas is pretty low. Really? Implying that that's why we made this graph. We wouldn't have put it that, there. Um, and it's they are pretty given good. protective antibodies. But huh? okay. the majority of those studies turned up just four of these malaria antigens uh -huh. as the candidates. Okay. They were all sporozoid antigens. And we are making vaccines against sporozoids. We are. We've talked about them. We on did. Twip. We did. We did. So now we're talking about another stage of the parasite, right? Mm -hmm. The skyzont. Or the schizont. There are two different pronunciations for this. Skyzont or schizont, it's the same stage, right? Uh -huh. It's the stage at which the parasite finally divides into 
And then you can say into 8, into 12, into 16. It depends on the species. All right, Dixon, you part. have to start at the beginning. The Let's mosquito the beginning. bites you okay. and injects sporozoites. Sporozoites, that's right. They go to your liver. liver. and They then reproduce like crazy. Reproduce in the liver. And they make cryptozoites. Cryptozoites meaning you can't see them and they're zoites. But the moment the cryptozoite stage bursts open and releases their contents into the blood, each little cryptozoite is now called a merozoite. And the merozoite cannot go back to the liver, but now must seek out and find and infect a red blood cell. Okay, that's their job. Their job. And they don't seek them out, of course. They just run into them because they, there's right. zillions of them in the bloodstream. So then they get in them. <clears throat> they get in the red cells. And the first thing they do is make a ring structure. Well, they look like a ring. But it's just a. It's an stage early, of the early, parasite. early trophozoite stage. It's a single cell, though. Remember that. It's a single cell. So the parasite, first of all, grows and develops, and then it reproduces. Within the red blood cell? Within the red cell. And it's using hemoglobin. It's extracting the, mm-hmm. the heme, saving it as a crystal of waste right. in the middle of the cell. And then they get out. Now, remember, and then they divide. The nuclei divide, but they, the syncytium of cytoplasm remains constant. So although it's a multinucleated single cell... With one cytoplasm, at some point, the cytoplasm divides and sequesters each of these merozoites and excludes from that division cycle the deposit of hemozoan, which is the leftover part of digesting hemoglobin. What an elegant system for this parasite to carry out its life cycle. And at the last moment, after the merozoites have all become individualized by membrane Mm-hmm. Skyzogony or, or division, as it were. The Greek word for division is, is, is schizo. So that's where the term schizophrenic. So the schizont is before this division occurs, right? The schizont. Is the red blood cell full of these? Uh, well, that's a pre schizont. It's a, it's a late developing uh, multi nucleated trophy. Well, we can't. Don't point your finger like that at it's your book. My book. <laughs> I didn't do all of those things in the book, but the point is that. that you wouldn't call it a fully mature schizont until the membranes have formed. Okay. And on a light microscope picture of a red cell that's infected with malaria, you wouldn't be able to tell that. You'd have to use an electron microscope to see. So that's the last stage before the parasites burst out of the now empty red cell because it ate everything. You know, I can't believe they ate the whole thing. Well, in this case, I can't believe that all of those merozoites consumed all of that hemoglobin, but indeed, that's what happened. And those released merozoites can then infect more red blood cells? That's right, and it's a continuing pattern of infection and reinfection and infection and reinfection. But remember, like virus infections, right? Mm -hmm. We start with an attachment phase, and then it's included into the cytoplasm. Right. And then it takes its genome and inserts it into the cytoplasm and starts replicating. In this case, the parasite is a eukaryotic organism, so it doesn't have to do that. It carries its own nucleus inside the red cell, and it uses instructions from that nucleus to engineer its own replication cycle. Okay. And now here we have, but we have a similar exit strategy that viruses have to employ in order to get out to infect the next cell, unless you're going to stay there as a latent infection, right? So... I'm trying to make bridges between the small and the <laughs> ultra small. Yeah, if you if you want to spread to new hosts, you have to exit. You've got to get out of that cell. Even the herpes viruses, which right. are latent, that periodically right. have right. to reactivate, make virus, and spread to a new host. So some of these viruses destroy the cell to do What that. is the destiny of a parasite that does not spread right. to a new host, Dixon? They get eaten by macrophages and well, digested. Viruses, parasites in general, are doomed. They are. Why unless, would they want to do that? Unless you happen to be well, eaten, eaten by another animal, which can happen in nature. These yes or no? Oh, of course. Oh yeah. Oh sure. They could transfer from one animal to another by ingestion of meat. I know a parasite that does that. In fact, I worked on one for many years. Trichinella. Toxoplasma does the same thing, except they have an exit stage as well. So they've they've got it covered in both ways. All right. <laughs> Back to the story. Tanzania Back to the story. cohort of two-year-olds. So, so, so highly diseased and not so highly they diseased. They call them resistant kids and non-resistant kids based on 
parasite density in the blood. And clinical symptoms. Clinical symptoms, right? So they say these, and they're all from the same village in they Tanzania. Are. They are. Because that may make a difference. And then they take serum from both. It means that there's not a lot of inbreeding among the people there. That's right. That's what it means. Because okay. otherwise, this would be evenly distributed okay. throughout the village. But it's maybe, not. Maybe not. And then they take the serum and they ask, do the antibodies within the resistant kids recognize something that is not present right. in the susceptible right. kids? Now, that's not a new technology. That's not a new strategy for identifying antigens, by the way. That's been done from the start. And that's how the circumsporozoite antigen was identified. Do you know how they did this? They, took, they made cDNA libraries uh, of plasmodium of all right. the mRNAs, encoding all the proteins. They made plasmids. Wow. And then they screen those with the antisera wow. to see which of the encoded proteins. How many proteins does plasmodium falciparum make? I don't know. Make? Humans, 20 to 30,000. So this is a lot genes. of screening. I don't think plasmodium makes that many proteins, but I think it well, makes they screen a million thousands. clones for each. Uh, it makes thousands. And then they identified three clones recognized wow. by antibodies wow. from the resistant wow. and not susceptible individuals. That's incredible. So if anything was recognized by both, yeah, yeah. Out, would, out it yep. would go. Yep. They yep. only want susceptible. Exactly. Are, we, are you with me so far? Um, are you with me so far? Because mm. you can do the molecular right biology, but I'll do the... Um, schizons. I'm right across the desk. You are. I must be with you. You are. Three I, clones. We're making eye contact, too, Three folks. clones. Three. Count them. Three. I'm hypnosing you. Hypnotizing. You're tridenting me. <laughs> Three clones were identified that, that fulfill right. these criteria. Three. Okay, is everyone with us? Yeah. I'm, I'm talking to our listeners. Uh, of course. Okay, so now then we have the, we have the genome sequence of plasmodium, so then you can ask what do they encode. Exactly. All right? Exactly. So, yes. one yes. encodes um, a hypothetical gene on chromosome 10. Another encodes a hypothetical gene on chromosome 11. <laughs> right. <laughs> and another encodes a merozoite surface protein uh. involved in red blood cell invasion, Indeed. in which they say others are currently investigating as a right. vaccine so candidate. So can leave that one alone. So you can leave that one alone. And so they're down to two now. Right, two. So they picked one of those two. They picked... Um, one called PF3D7-102180. 244 <laughs> kilodalton. It encodes a 244 kilodalton. Acidic phosphoprotein. What does that mean? Exactly right. What's that's an acidic exact, phosphoprotein? That's what I said. What is it? Well, first let's it do? do the easy part. Acidic right. means at neutral pH. Yeah. It's, it's isoelectric point is acidic. Yes. That's how you'd figure that out, right? You're doing an isoelectric point. Exactly. And then phosphoprotein means it's got, it's got phosphorus covalently linked to it. Right. It's been phosphorylated. Exactly. Right? So it's um, an activated protein, you think? Activated? We don't know if that's activating it. Who knows? Usually could, activates things from not. other sources. So the name of it is now based on all the experiments we're going to hear. But we have to, and it's in the title, PFSEA. PF right. Plasmodium Falciparum Schizont. Egress. Egress. Antigen. Why do they use the word egress rather than exit? Or Because P.T. Barnum <laughs> used the word egress, this way to the egress. Yeah. And everyone thought it was an animal and they left. That's, <laughs> do you know that story? I don't, but that's a great story. Yeah, and that's it's one story. of his circuses. You know, P.T. Barnum was yeah, 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 the yeah. circus founder. That's he right, had right. a sign, this way to the egress. He also said every, there's a sucker born every minute. And everyone left <laughs> and went through that door thinking they were going to see an animal and they right. left. That's he wanted funny. to get them out. That's extremely funny. <laughs> there's like a sucker it. born every minute? That's true. You know where the P.T. Barnum Museum is? No. It's in Hartford, Connecticut. Are you sure that's not in Ohio? Yeah, I'm very sure it's because I've visited it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. I don't know if everyone will get that joke. It's, right. an, it's kind of an insider joke. It's Twix a joke, stupid right? mistake that I made early on. Which you'll never forget. Of course not. Uh, everyone lets you know that you've made a mistake when you've made a mistake. I don't mind. I, I'm, I don't mind. And I, I'm enough of a, um, let's see, I have a strong enough ego to say that, yeah, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. And I'm sorry for the ones that hurt people, and I'm not so sorry for the ones that uh, just hurt myself, I guess. But uh, in this case, it's a minor. It's okay. PFSEA, 
PF. Highly conserved among all the isolates. PFSEA number one, because there may be others. Yes, and also no homology to any known protein. So we can't figure out that's what it does. That's really too bad. So that's the thing. When you discover that's a gene and you want to know what it does, the first thing you do is to say, does it have homology so to Vincent, genes uh, that encode proteins of known functions I, I like, ask you a hang on, dude, enzymes, <laughs> polymerases, proteases, sure. uh Tubulins, you know, actins, all that. They're all, all that motifs stuff. that will say this protein is... Clathrins. This, this doesn't fit into that. No, it doesn't. And so I need to ask you this question. Yes, yes. Of right. all of the genes in the human genome that yeah. we've sequenced, and we know every one every of them. Every single one of them. And we know now all of the proteins, therefore, that these genes encode. Predicted, predicted. How many of the proteins that we've discovered do we actually know the functions for? What percentage of the human genome has been accounted for by functionality? Mm, I don't know. You want me to look it up? I would love you to look <laughs> that up. What would be the query? Because we've worked on that genome more than any other genome. And if we don't know everything about that genome, then it's likely that we'll struggle with these other genomes. And this is one of the ones that we're going to struggle with, I'm sure. But we'd love to know the function of every protein. I'm going to guess yeah, 20%. 20 Wow, that's a lot of missing functionality, isn't it? But I might be way off. The human genome has 20,000 protein coding genes. Okay. And of those 20,000, how many of them are we sure of in terms of what they do? I don't know. I'd even love to know how many are structural proteins versus how many are functional proteins in pathways or enzymatic pathways. Remember, there are also lots of non-coding Sequences that are very important in the genome. No, but that doesn't talk about those. It only talks about the proteins. So yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in about the proteins. I don't know the, that number. Well, that's something that everyone should know, don't you think, Vincent? <laughs> like Norwalk, Ohio versus Norwalk, Connecticut. <laughs> Human genes uh, categorized by function. Right. Okay, 23% are uncategorized. So 80% are categorized. Wow. So it's, way high. it's the opposite of what I predicted. 77% that we know about. So the others are missing in action. Well, they don't know what they do. We look right. at them and say, yep, yep, yep. doesn't look Duh, like anything else. Don't we don't know what they do. Right. So what if we were to express each one of those missing this functional a, proteins, should put this in make an notes. antibody against it, and find out where it is in the cell at least? Wouldn't that help in terms of discer discerning what they do? No. Finding out where it is is not even... It good. might turn out to be a structural unit of some sort that we're yeah, not what if aware it's not? of yet. I mean, yeah, you can do that, but... Not what if it's not or what if it is. You no, then you can affect its ability to function by using the antibody. Oh, my goodness, that's what they did here. <laughs> and did they find out what this did when they did that? Well, first of all, they tried... This is the first thing you do. If you don't have a protein of unknown function, right. you try and get rid of it. Exactly right. And see what happens to the cell. Right. So they couldn't do that. Because <laughs> no. apparently it's essential for the proliferation of this parasite. Oh. And they couldn't disrupt it. But the word but egress what, is in the title. Well, we're getting to that. I know we are. It's not there yet. No. So instead, if you can't remove a gene, then you can knock it down. By? Well, they use uh, an interesting way. They call it shield shield uh, expression. Meaning knocking it down as the, you it's diminish its function? You diminish its function, but you do it conditionally because apparently if this is essential, you can't have it knocked out all the time. Got it. So Otherwise it's Conditional lethal. knockdown. Got it. They get about 75 decrease in the level of the protein. And these are inhibited for their replication. Now, that, that brings up a question. It when does. they say inhibition of parasite replication, right. what, what, at what stage would okay. you be measuring okay. that? Okay, so let's go back. Let's go back. Go back in time. No, not so far. No, you don't have to go that far back. You can go back to 1976, actually, <laughs> when Jim Jensen entered the laboratory of William Traeger. And grew them. At Rockefeller, right. yeah. And then they developed an in vitro culture system. And so that in vitro culture system is being used to this day. Yeah. And so how you measure replication is simply you do counts of infected versus non-infected red cells. So you say how many red cells in this culture are, have schizonts in them? Or Not just schizonts, sh any parasites. Rings. Rings. Any, any stage. Okay. Any stage. And it gives you a percentage so of Dixon, parasitemia. If I take a red blood cell that is yes. infected and yes. put it in a dish with uninfected right. red blood cells over right. time, right. The, the parasites will get out and move to the other red blood cells they in a will. culture, right? That's true. So that's your measure of replication. This is exactly okay. right. 
That's pretty straightforward. So it's when they knock down this gene, it doesn't. You get eighty percent inhibition. Right. So in other words, instead of seeing a hundred yes infected red blood cells, yes, you would see twenty. That's right. So. The answer then, it still doesn't tell you what's going on, though. No, it doesn't, but it tells you that it's important for it spreading, does. right? It but does. There could be many different steps. Oh, uh, but of course. It could be dividing, it could be getting out, it could be getting in, right, to a red blood cell. All of those are good possibilities. Okay. So what do they do next? Uh-huh. I'm looking at it here. You know what they discovered? Well, they, they did- said here, listen to this, Dixon. <laughs> Parasites grown for a single cycle in the absence of... Um, well, in the absence of this protein, a reduced level had delayed chisant egress. Right. Can you can you look at it and see when the egress is happening? Yeah, if you synchronize them, you can. Of course, you can. That's why they say single cycle. Right? Ah, that's right. So, what they've really discovered is a function for a protein which helps the parasite escape from its eaten up host cell. Egress. Now, do viruses have mechanisms like that too, Vincent? Sure. Like, name one. Give us an example. Of how, of a protein that helps the virus get out? Yeah. You want the name? I think well, exist. I don't want to, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Did I put you on the spot? <laughs> Names of pro- viral proteins yeah. that help them get yeah. out. Yeah. yeah, Like poliovirus. How does poliovirus get out of a host well, cell? Well, we don't know. It, really? The cells burst. You don't know. We don't know what You don't know. It. You're sitting there and you're telling me. It's not known. It's not expert, that I don't know. It's not known. The person known. Who, co- who, who created a polio virus from scratch from does not off know the shelf chemicals. How, the, <laughs> how the virus actually gets out of a host cell nah, and goes on to another host cell? That's right. Are you trying to tell me that there's equal ignorance at the virology level and there is at the parasite level? Not only do I not know, <laughs> but every David other... Baltimore doesn't know either. Every other virologist doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, you just got finished so from adenovirus, a meeting, right? So adenovirus, for example, encodes a protein that helps lyse the cells. And, you know, apoptosis, program, cells. program cell death is a means by which some sure. viruses get out of cells. Right. Others bud from the surface and don't kill the cell. Of course, the they cell. don't kill the cell at all or not right, for a while. but they still they get out. Yeah. So those are the enveloped viruses. Is yes. that correct? Yes, and of course, they encode okay. proteins that interact with uh-huh. the escort pathway. Look at that. The cell See? that helps them to but bud out. But that's not happening here, it is isn't, it? apparently. Because this parasite actually consumes the entire contents of a red cell in its, a, in its quest to make more of itself. That's right. But it's still trapped in the outer membrane that it, it that it entered, and it, to be honest with you, it's not actually inside that membrane. It's not in the membrane. Get it? Because it's like sticking your finger in a balloon, and making your fist enter the balloon, and you've, you're surrounded by the rubber membrane, right? But you're not inside the balloon. You're still on the outside of the balloon because you're surrounded by a membrane. In this case, it's the rubber membrane. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But in the case of the malaria parasite, it's the double, the bilayer lipid membrane that we know so well from uh, mammalian cell biology. So the merozoite develops into a, that's called a parasitophorous vacuole. Okay? And so this parasite has a, a food vacuole that it uses to include some of the hemoglobin from the cell's contents through a a hole that it has to make through the parasitophorous vacuole in order to access the material. Or it sucks in a portion of the membrane as well and then digests it and digests the hemoglobin. It's complicated biology. The point is that when the, when the merozoites are formed during schizogony, each one is surrounded by a portion of that membrane. Now, that's puzzling for everybody because where the heck does the proteins for the membrane come from? It has to come from the host cell, right? And if you look at a red cell, it's inactive. It doesn't have a nucleus, right? So it has. It must have a lot of extra membrane proteins sitting around in its cytoplasm. Why would a red cell have extra membrane proteins sitting around in its cytoplasm? A normal red cell. It doesn't ingest anything. What is that all about? Because if that weren't the case... Plasmodium wouldn't succeed because it couldn't make a parasitophorous vacuole to begin with. So these are really interesting cellular biology questions. So this is a protein 
That prevents exit. Right. Uh, it's a malaria protein. No, it's not a protein that prevents exit. It's one that facilitates, it facilitates exit. If you take it away, you prevent right. exit. Right. And where is it? Okay, so well, then let's, they... Let's get to that. Exactly. But first of all, they show that this protein... Yes. ...is in fact recognized by sera from the resistant ah, individuals. Perfect. And not susceptible. Perfect. They had to do that. But they wait also a minute, show, that's self-fulfilling though because they selected it that way. Well, they have to go make complete right. the circle and make sure that <laughs> oh, this okay. is... Because, you know, all so along the, the way... Sort of postulates of uh, molecular biology. <laughs> in a way. And then they have... Uh, they make ant- they, it, they produce the protein. Right. And they raise antibodies right. to it. And then they stain right. uh, malaria-infected red blood cells. Uh, and they yeah, show yeah. that the antibody reacts with infected but not infected red blood cells. So that means it is against the malaria protein. You have right. to do all this. So it's important. you expressed puzzlement over the fact that here is an... Uh, it's not an intracellular parasite. It's living within a vacuole that then exports proteins to the surface of the host cell. You expressed surprise. I, I think it was ignorant surprise. Well, no, no, no. It's why surprise. Not? It's genuine surprise. Why it's not? It genu- could happen, right? Uh, exactly right. I mean, Because viruses put... They don't put. They direct the synthesis of proteins exactly. that get on the cell surface that, too, right? Those are you're sure, fine. absolutely right. It's absolutely consistent with the parasitic lifestyle. Uh, exactly. All right. Now we're going to do some experiments to uh-huh. look at inhibition of growth. Right. All right. So what they do is, this is where your expertise is important. Uh oh. Right. They use antibodies prepared against a expressed or a synthesized or recombinant version of the protein. Right. Meaning you have a clone. Right. A plasmid that right. contains the gene. You put right. it in some system like E. coli. Right. You produce protein. You purify. You immunize. And now you have antibodies. That's okay. Right. They say, do these antibodies inhibit growth? So what they say is parasites were synchronized to the ring stage. Yes. That's the early stage in the red blood cell. That's right. So they all start out at the start line together. And then they put them in culture. Right. To obtain mature trophozoites. Correct. Now, a mature trophozoite... It's within the red blood cell it's, still. It's all, well, when you say within the red blood cell, you're, you're using a euphemism here. It's not, not much actually left. inside the red blood cell. You see what I'm saying? No. It's inside the parasitivorous vacuole. Within the red blood cell. Within the red blood cell. Yeah, it's, right. It's, so if it's, you pick it's up the tricky, cell, tricky. it's going to go with the red blood cell. Oh, of course, right? of course, of course. Then they incubate it with the antibody or with they the do. control. They do. And then they measure new ring stage Why invasions. would they do it at the trophozoid stage? I don't know, Dixon. Well, because the, the time from trophozoite to schizot is very short. Mm-hmm. And they, are, they don't have to risk degradation of their product, their antibody molecule, while it's in culture. So with the, the time from the ring is longer? Much longer. Yeah, it's two days, three days. Depends on the life cycle. So they're basically measuring how much is coming out by burst and then infecting right. new red blood cells and making right. new rings, exactly. right? All they're doing is looking for the number of cells infected. Okay, so basically what they find is if they use the antibody against this protein, it inhibits parasite growth from 60 to 74%. But not parasite growth. That's what they say here. Well, it they inhibits. They say inhibited parasite growth. That's their words, not mine. I know, but what they really meant to say was they inhibited the expression of merozoites into the culture to get into another red cell. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Right. It, that growth is not a good word for that. The growth of the colony, perhaps. They also made monoclonals and didn't right. find against this protein. Right. Monoclonal antibody is one directed at a single epitope, Correct. which is a Correct. 10 to 12 amino acid sequence. Yes. yes, And they have the same effect. They are inhibitory. Isn't that interesting, though? They also purify Wait. antibodies. What's I want to stop right there for a moment. Yeah, you go ahead. How many epitopes do you think a 244 kilodalton Lots. acidic phosphoprotein has? Lots. Me too. Now, what are the chances that you made a monoclonal antibody against only one of those lots that actually still works? Actually, they say not all monoclonals mediated growth inhibition, which you would expect, so right? So they got lucky. Well, they probably screened a bunch of them. Okay. They probably screened hundreds. They screened, screened thousands. As, they screened as many as would react with the protein. Yeah. And they can do that. And so do they monoclonals, know? Monoclonals, you can do high throughput of screening. Of course so you can. And they can also determine. <laughs> <laughs> Vincent just tapped. He did an autotrophic tap on his. Every computer. time Dixon wants to make a point, he taps my. <laughs> no, I asked you to go look because you've, you've got. And you've got so the, I you've just got tapped it in response. You're the librarian to him. in this case. So <laughs> the point is that 
they could do a further experiment, couldn't they? They could actually find out which portion of that 244 kilodalton protein the monoclonal actually they inter- could, sure. interacted with. I'm sure they and know. That might give you some hint as to what it does if you could determine Maybe. what that 12 amino acid structure Maybe. was. Maybe, but I think they want to know for vaccine That's purposes. another paper. Right. <laughs> That's another paper. That's right. They purify antibodies from human serum and show that they are also inhibitory Bingo. in this assay. Right. Okay. Do they also interact with the same epitope? They didn't say. It's but another paper. Fl- but wait a minute. It's an easy experiment, isn't it? Well, of course. How would you do that? Well, polyclonals react by definition with many epitopes. Right. So you don't know which one is inhibitory. But the monoclonal that reacted that did inhibit Mm-hmm. would prevent, by displacement, the polyclonal antibodies from inhibiting, except for the others that would attach to the molecule and not inhibit. Yeah, except but the, the end result is inhibition. No, I know that, but then it would allow you to collect the natural it. antibody against yeah. the proper epitope. You could map it easily, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next thing, where are these proteins located? Where is this protein, PFSEA-1? That's a heck of a question. If you were to guess before yeah. knowing this, yeah. Yeah. would you say it's on the outside or the inside? Well, knowing where the parasite lives, I would say it's on the inside because it has to come from the parasite and get into the host. Yeah, but we know that viruses are inside and they put proteins on the surface. So yeah, well, it could have been on the outside. But if you as think well. a moment, wait a minute, I'm going to modify my guess. Here Go ahead. Because if you think of what the outside of the host membrane is with relationship to the parasite, yes. then the parasite really faces the outer surface of the host membrane. Yeah, the but parasite, you're going to tell me a vacuole, right? you're yeah. going to tell me that this protein, two forty four kilodalton acidic phosphoprotein, locates to the inner surface of the parasitophorus vacuole, which means that it was transported across the membrane and then stuck to the inner surface. Right. Why would a parasite want to do that? So basically, for their first. Staining suggests that it was on the surface because it co-localized with a surface protein. Right. But then when glycophorin, they looked... Glycophorin. They looked at glycophorin, glycophorin, right? That's on the outside surface, It certainly right? is. It's on but every red cell. It's a very they, common protein on the outside. Of and they said, okay, it's on, um, it's on the outside. But then when they looked more carefully, right. they could actually see that it was uh, inside. Let's find the words where they say that here. It, right. It, it, it cytolocalized to the inner surface of the protein lipid bilayer. PFSA localized to the schizont parasitophorus vacuole membrane. Yes, but that's the, that's the red cell membrane. <laughs> parasitophorus vacuole is inside the red blood cell. But it was made with, para- it was made I know, with but red cell membrane I know, but it's inside the red blood material. cell membrane. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And the inner leaflet of the red blood cell membrane. And the inner leaflet. Okay. You know what the inner leaflet is? It's right I below. I so plasma membrane has an outer and an inner leaflet. That's true. So this is on the inner leaflet as well as in some other places, right? They say wait, this is... Wait, Go so ahead. the membranes are numbered, right? Let's number the outer membrane as number one <laughs> and the inner membrane as number two. What is the inner membrane? The parasitophorus vacuole? No, just a lip. A, you've got it's two bilayer. proteins. Well, you don't call it... It's one membrane. But with two, you, with a, it's made up of two layers of I phospholipids. I, I, I spent my, but it's not membrane one and membrane two. No, but I want to number them now because I want you to say which number membrane the protein actually. One is on the outside, two is on the inside. It's number two that this protein is associated number with. Number two. You sure it wasn't the inner surface of number one? <laughs> There's one bilayer surrounding There's the red two blood protein cell. protein layers. There's no, not proteins. They're phospholipids. The outer layer of a protein of a layer of of the membrane is protein. Yes, a plasma membrane of the red blood yeah, cell. Yeah, let's go through this. Is a single membrane consisting of a bilayer of yep. phospholipids. The outer bilayer and the inner bilayer. What's the outer outer layer? No, there's no outer outer. There's just an <laughs> outer bilayer and an inner isn't there, bilayer. Isn't there a layer of protein on the outside? No, no. There's no layer of protein. They're embedded proteins in. Oh, that's what I'm thinking it. of. That's what. And I'm that's thinking. not where oh, okay. PFSA sits. Okay, okay. okay. Okay, okay. It sits, okay. think of a, okay. of a basketball okay. inside okay. where the air is. You no, know, no, I got it, I got it. Okay. <laughs> Against the rubber okay, of the okay, basketball, okay. that's where this... Okay, we've, we've carefully defined this. So it's not on the outside. No, it's within the matrix of the lipid bilayer. And they say because it's there, it may have a role in egress. It's within the lip matrix of the lipid bilayer. What's the matrix? What that's are you talking about? That's the inner surface of I never heard it layer. called the matrix. Well, 
It is a it phospholipid is? layer, <laughs> of which each membrane has two. Are we are we okay here? Yeah, we're okay. Do I need to draw you a picture? No, I, I, I'm crystal, as they would say in uh, a few good men. So they basically say this must have a role in egress. So let's test this. Right. So they take their antibodies, they synchronize the parasites to the ring stage at high density. They culture them to obtain early schizonts, and then they incubate them with the antibody. Uh, and then they follow the... So early schizonts are before the membranes actually right. divide off. So they add the antibodies before they would rupture, right? Right. And then ask how many new red blood right. cells. And these really inhibit right. the movement. And so That's incredible. they're inhibiting egress. But Dixon... That's amazing. They're not permeabilizing the red blood cells. How do the antibodies uh, get in? Well, we did look that one up before the show started, so I have to, I have to hearken back to our earlier conversation. Yeah, tell tell us what we apparently found. the parasite presence of the parasite causes the um, lipid bilayer to permeabilize to yeah. antibody. Because normally the antibodies Ordinarily, don't get into cell unless you correct. break the membranes. Right? Exactly. Right. Or monoclonals have a chance to get through, but. Not divalent cation, not divalent. Now, even uh, monoclonals won't get in. ATP will not get in. No, that's right. But ATP gets into the red cells, by the way. Infected because, red blood yeah, cells. Yeah, because that was one yeah. of the requirements in the extracellular fluid that Traeger and Jensen came up with as a, a needed metabolo, metabolite. rather. They had to add ATP to the medium in order to get the parasites to replicate. Next thing they do is ask, can we protect mice from infection? Right. What would you use for that? Well, I'd use a mouse... Malaria. Which there are many. There's Plasmodium uelei. Uel I love that. Uelei. There's Plasmodium bergii. And that's what they use. And there's a lot of other Plasmodium. Did you know Dr. Shibori? Bergi? I knew Dr. Uelei. Really? Yeah, he was at NYU. He worked with Dr. Newsom. So they, they, they clone the P. bergi version of PFSEA1. Right. right. They, make the pro they, they use the protein to immunize... Right. They make the protein in E. coli, they use it to immunize mice, and then they challenge them. Right. Intraperitoneally. Right. And they're protected. How about that? They are protected with uh, the this is immunizing good stuff. with the protein, but not See, with a control. You're never going to get a sterile immunity with any vaccine against malaria. You're never going to get that, okay? It's just too complicated right. a life cycle. But you will be able to prevent the clinical manifestations of severe malaria with a good vaccine. And that's that's the aim of, of malaria vaccine. Yeah, they had reduced parasitemia and longer survival, but they weren't protected the, 100% the, from infection. No, the no, problem no. with a vaccine of that nature is that it will not prevent the spread of malaria from immunized persons to non-immunized persons. So on an epidemiological basis, it would not reduce the number of cases, but it would reduce the, the number of deaths probably. So there's an interesting caveat to all of this. Right? So patients in Kenya, particularly in West Africa, in a clinic that was studied studied the mental capacity of children upon having repeated cerebral malaria episodes. Now, Plasmodium falciparum causes cerebral malaria. That's what it's known as, okay? And what they found was quite telling was that while the patients survived these severe attacks, their capacity to reason and to think clearly was reduced after every episode a little bit each time, but after seven or eight episodes, you can imagine that this might take a toll on the, the intelligence factor associated with being human. And so, a vaccine that only prevents the severe clinical effects, mm. but doesn't prevent an attack, might be viewed as a great thing to begin with, but... Sure. Yeah. If this data stands up over time, it's a pyrrhic victory because the parasite still wins. Now, why would it, the parasite want you to be stupider? And the answer is we don't know. Well, I think the the goal here would be to combine this vaccine with some of the others being that's developed. Right, that's right. Because right. no one alone sure, is that's probably right. going to be So, But the one that effective. uses irradiated sporozoa seems to have the best possibility, but it's very difficult to produce. Yes, we need something easier to produce than that. Yeah, we need an artificial sporozoite, basically. Now, they go back to their cohorts. The Ken, they go back to the Tanzanian cohort, and they yep. also look at a Kenyan cohort. I noticed you said Tanzanian then. That's very good of you. trying to say it properly, dude. <laughs> 
and they ask, do these antibodies? Antibodies, now they can look specifically right. for antibodies against right. this protein in their blood. They can do the seroepidemiology. And they say, does that correlate with protection? And yeah, yeah, the yeah. answer is yes. It's wow. very well. It that's correlates fantastic. significantly. That's fantastic. Now, that's, of course, a correlation. Yep. And it, that tells you, though, that you can go ahead and do a vaccine trial. You can you produce could. a vaccine and eventually that. get into people and see if it's protective. Yeah. Right? Yep. And this is very interesting, Dixon. They have a community in western Kenya, north yes. of Lake Victoria. This, this may be the same community that was studied for the effect of repeated malaria. They get 300 infectious bites per person yeah, yeah, per yeah. year. That's right. That's Almost right. every day I know. you get bitten. I know. Oh, my gosh. I know. And it turns out that only one in a thousand mosquitoes are infected. So how many bites is that? No, it's 300 bites per person per year. That's an infected mosquito, one per day? In a uh, thousand? A one in a thousand? Year. So you're bitten a thousand times a day? No, no. Yeah, one, yeah, 300. Yeah. No, no. You know, infectious bites, that's yeah. right. It's so, not just bites. So yeah. the point is... You're getting a lot of bites a day. What <laughs> other things do these mosquitoes carry How besides... How do these people take this? I guess they have no choice. Pro- are they used to it? Oh, they, they do. They develop an energy, it's called, ah. to these, so the salivary secretions of the mosquitoes. They don't even get itches. I'd get out of there. <laughs> I'd come to New Jersey. That's the, that's the cure for tropical diseases. You know that, don't you? But get Win- out. Winter. Yeah. But there's no winter in Lake there's Victoria. There's no choice. There's no choice here at Vincent. And that's the pathetic. That's what drives public health. Why do people live in regions full of parasites? Wait a minute. You... Stop it. That's where we started as a species. You're going to have to ask a different yeah, but question. Many of us left for that reason. No, we didn't leave for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we didn't. We, li- we left. We almost left, period. We almost hyenas, were extincted for that reason, but we didn't leave for the that. The hyenas reason. were chasing us out. Yeah, something like that. It was more food up north, fewer something animals. Like well, we have long- wanderlust in there our blood. There are many blood. places on earth that are not habitable. At all. So people don't live there. Name one. Oh, the, the poles. Nobody really lives there. Well, the pole in the north is not a landmass, so don't talk about that. It's not. I yeah. didn't say landmass. I just said there are many places on well, earth. Well, that's not a place then. If it's not a landmass, it's break. not a place. It's a place. <laughs> of course, it's a place. No, Antarctica <laughs> was the only continent not occupied by humans, but we occupy that now too. There are many places on earth that are not occupied by humans. They're yeah, extreme. And they're too high or you too think? low. You yes. Think? yes. Too high. Yeah. Where am I going next month? Yeah, you're going to Machu Picchu because yeah, you're crazy. How high is that? Yeah, no, how many people live there? 14, a lot of people live there. I thought the place was abandoned. 14,000 Just full feet. of tourists now. <laughs> That's not the highest Look, place people live either. There are places where people do not live, okay? Do people live in Death Valley, California, wherever the hell that is? Some do. Yeah, very few, okay? No, there are the, reasons for okay, this. Well, this place where you get bitten a thousand times a day or whatever I know what you're trying is. to drive into. It's ridiculous. But people don't move out just because diseases well, are Well, I there. would. I know you would, but look at Ebola. Look I'm at, about to move out of New Jersey because of the conditions <laughs> there. Look at Ebola virus. No, just kidding. If you lived in an Ebola endemic center, you'd feel very uncomfortable right now because of the outbreak that's occurring. Of course. And But people are not moving out. No. In fact, they're not. They're trying to help the people that well, are sick. That's their home, right? Of course. Then that's the answer. They, that's that's the answer. Their whole family is there. The they answer. have nowhere else to go. But that's you understand, Dixon the movement of peoples has happened many times in history. Oh, and for many reasons. And, you know, when the Dust sure, Bowl of sure, the sure, U.S. Sure, got sure. bad, people went to California, no, that's right? right? That's Sometimes the, you have to good. move. And for me, a thousand bites a day would be a moving thing. The only thing, <laughs> the only reason people move is for resources. If you run out of resources, okay? So you find abandoned civilizations that ran out of resources. And if you read Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, he documents that like crazy. Mm. So people didn't I, I run out of resources there. I understand. I understand that if people can't readily move. Yeah, that's, a, that's a horrible that, thing to say. Because so the thing is, if we didn't live in these parasite-infested areas, we wouldn't have to be developing countermeasures until they came up to our area because of global climate change. So right? my <laughs> – listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> so my take on the human condition and the reason why we got to where we are today is because in the old days – when there were many hominid species roaming the earth, particularly Homo habilis that moved up into Europe and evolved into Neanderthal, and the uh, the other subspecies of humans that developed, they developed that way after they moved out of Africa. Mm-hmm. So Africa was a hotbed for not only human development, but it was a hotbed for disease development as well, for evolution of infectious diseases. And every, you know what goes on there. We've 
chronicled this in every single episode of This Week in Virology. We're trying to do the same thing with This Week in Parasitism. For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. That's the disease epidemiology now. So you come up with a, an evolving disease that develops a new antigenic signature, and what's the outcome? You kill off 90% of your victims, and then 10% survive. Why? Because they're pre-adapted, because their genes evolved too, and their immune systems evolved too, and then eventually you're going to end up with an answer to that infectious agent. And you keep doing this for infectious agents. Eventually, your warehouse of resources is extensive. But if you evolve in an area with very few infectious diseases, like a colder climate, for instance, northern Europe during the Ice Age, for instance, then your answers are less robust. So then what happens when you encounter somebody who's laden with these infections that are not causing disease in them, but they've never even seen them? You know what the, <laughs> you did me a cut in the throat thing. They get wiped out, right? They get wiped out. So I think that by the fact that we migrated out of Africa after we developed all of these counterattacks to all these infectious agents, enabled us to survive and to spread diseases to other hominids that could not react as we did. And we inadvertently extincted them by our mere presence. Maybe. That's, that's it, my that's hypothesis, and I'm sticking to it. Because now, it, now it's too late to leave. I mean, Africa has a big pop. Sub-Saharan Africa has a huge population. People don't want to leave. They and they don't stay. want to, I understand. So we will do work like you know what, this the only to thing, help them live you, there without yes. malaria. You know right? the only thing that causes people to migrate? What? Civil war. They migrate. They go to places that they know they shouldn't go to. And by the way, they do go. They do not go to some places that they know are hotbed for transmission of Setsi virus. Uh, Setsi, uh, uh, Setsi transmitted trypanosomiasis. The people who don't raise cattle don't live in those areas because that's a null zone for people. But if they can raise their cattle there, and there are some strains of cattle that are resistant to uh, trypanosomiasis, they will live there even though they know that they are susceptible to the infection, which is also very sad. But if you look at the distribution of cattle in Africa and the distribution of people in Africa, <clears throat> you will find a one-to-one -one correlation almost. <clears throat> in sub-Saharan Africa, there's a narrow zone between the desert Mm -hmm. And the transmission zone for Setsi fly uh, transmitted African trypanosomiasis. They're being squeezed by the desert from the north and squeezed by the Setsi fly from the south into this very, very narrow band. And, and so that's the reason why they live there, because it's relatively safe. And I agree with you. I think that if everyone was given an option to live anywhere they wanted, they would live in the place that's most amenable to their happiness. And having a disease like malaria or trypanosomiasis or... Ebola. Those are horrible things for people to have to live with, knowing that they can't do anything about it. And they're just victims. And being a victim is a horrible thing. No one likes to be victimized and by another person or by another thing. And so if you wanted to escape malaria and trypanosomiasis, where, would you, where would you not live? <laughs> well, I wouldn't live where the vectors live. Where is that? Well... Unfortunately, the vectors live almost everywhere. The, the Setsi fly doesn't live anywhere else except Africa. So that's easy to get away from, all right? But if you pick South America as an exit point, well, too bad because the triatomid bug lives there and there's an equivalent yeah, Chagas right. disease that will get you. But, so, so moving is not the, the if, no, solution. No, no, but, but if you live in a high mountainous area which has cold winters, the vectors are not there. Not so yet. If, not yet. As we you, read... Yeah, that's right. No, no, go. that's right. It, the, 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 the times, they are changing, and there's no yes, question the about it. Yes, is moving up the slopes. See, I followed Dylan, right. but I didn't follow Zappa. <laughs> Can I read the last sentence of this paper? You may. Our va a day to validate our field-to-lab strategy for identifying vaccine candidates. Bingo. And by blocking egress, this vaccine may synergize with other vaccines that target hepatocyte and red blood cell invasion. So you get two invasions, one extra vacation. Right. <laughs> and that might be a nice vaccine well, that a, does all three, right? There's a fourth one that they should have mentioned too then, and that is one which blocks... 
<laughs> There's a strange man outside our window, folks. That's pretty scary. <laughs> Somebody's washing our window. Somebody is washing our window. And, wow, we deserve it. And he so, just scared the heck out of you, right? It, well, it didn't scare me. He startled me. I was startled. But I, I knew that he was attached to something. I don't think he's else. washing our windows. They're doing repairs yeah, in the building. That's right. So we're, we better hurry because we're going to hear a lot of noise on the roof right now. Um, You've been listening to? Wait, wait. <laughs> There's another vaccine that's blocked, that blocks transmission, mm -hmm. all right, from the human to the mos from the mosquito rather to the human from the mosquito to the human so it, it's an antibody against a stage of development inside the mosquito itself that the mosquito picks up as it uh, sucks blood out of this immunized person the person that's infected uh, is not protected by the vaccine but the person that's infected by the mosquito biting again is protected so we consider that an altruistic vaccine dr robert guads our good friend who's been on our show several times helped in the um, the development of that vaccine candidate. So that's a fourth one. That's cool. So if you had all four together, you might be able to make real progress here. And to if you knock down the number of people below the certain level of transmission, even though the vector is there, you don't get transmission anymore because of the one in a thousand mosquitoes that contains malaria and only one per day that it bites you. So if you could knock those numbers down a bit, then you'd be in great shape. All right, Dixon. Do you want to do some email? I would love to do some email. Voxiquorum writes, Dear water-based life forms, It is 24 degrees in Overland Park, Kansas, and I am looking at a slide labeled Giardia lamblia, part of a museum exhibit on water and human overuse of water. Uh -huh. And Kansas is a great place to have that exhibit, isn't it? Because of the Ogallala Reservoir problem. Is it? Yeah, sure. I see a greenish lump. I don't know if it's alive. I was not meant to be a diagnostic technician. <laughs> a greenish lump. If it doesn't look like a little monkey face, it probably isn't what you're supposed to The exhibit to is produced by the American Museum of Natural History and water.org really? and really? is located in the museum at Prairie Fire. Fantastic. Maybe interesting to listeners in the Kansas City area. Cool. Thank you very much. My son lives in Kansas. He lives in uh, Wichita. I'll, I'll alert him. By the way, he uh, emergency landed an airplane the other night. That the emergency chute deployed inside the airplane in flight. Whoops. Okay, well that happens. You want to read the next one? <laughs> no, I'll it doesn't give you, happen. I'll give you my laptop. It can happen. Anything can happen, Dixon. Anything could happen. I'm going to give you my laptop. All right, I'm Here, don't friends, wreck it. Romans, and countrymen, give me your see laptop. The, you see Heather's email? I do see it. I'm repositioning my chair so I get a better shot at it. It says, I think I recall one of you mentoring a younger relative enjoying the game Plague Inc. during a podcast somewhat recently. With this vague notion in mind, I downloaded the game and have been enjoying it ever since. Normally, I don't like electronic games, but this one seems to use some very accurate algorithms to, stimulate, to simulate the spread of various real and imaginary pathogens, with the ultimate goal of the player being the total annihilation or enslavement of humanity. The game is played from the perspective of the pathogen and DNA is the currency of the game, which I thought was very clever. Most of the science in quotes the game is based on seems to be quite well researched also. I think a discussion of the game from the viewpoint of scientists who work with microbes and pathogens would make a very interesting twim or twiv. There are many kinds of pathogens besides parasites, including viruses. I have good luck uh, winning with both, even on the brutal level of difficulty. I have just subscribed to Urban Agriculture. I had no idea how I will keep up with four podcasts now. I have no idea how Dr. R keeps up with four of them. I can't, I can, oh, my glasses are failing me uh, here. I can keep on top of trouble with TWIV since I only have the most elementary virological background. Perhaps a virology primer like the early episodes of TWIP would help me and other listeners who don't know a ton of virology. Well, uh, you're in luck, Heather, because if you check out our intermediate stage TWIV broadcasts, we had Virology 101 podcasts in which we began at the level of what is a virus, how many kinds there are, how do they enter a cell, what happens after they get inside, and how do they get out. So I think we have a lot of help for you there if you just uh, check out Virology 101 episodes. Thanks for your email. Is that it, Dixon? You read the whole thing? I believe I did. 
and not well either. I'm not a good reader, I must uh, confess. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right about uh, Virology 101. Twiv.tv, you'll find Virology 101 there. We never got through the whole series, but we went as far as translation, I think. We did. We should update that, and uh, I'd, I'd be glad to be your dummy as you reveal the, tr the secrets and intricacies of uh, intracellular parasitism. Next one is from Tristan, who writes, Dear Vincent and Dixon, it's us. Yeah. I have to tell you that I'm a huge fan of TWIP, and I love listening to you guys. In November 2013, I did my first medical mission trip to Nazara, South Sudan. Uh-huh. Vincent, you probably already know an interesting fact about Nazara is that it's one of the first places Ebola virus was discovered in 1976. Uh -huh. After right. the short trip, I enjoyed the work so much that now I am trying to find funding or sponsorship to leave life here and work in Nazara for a couple of years. Hmm. I, pre I appreciate how your podcasts are both educational and entertaining at the same time. My favorite one so far is when you had Peter Hotez on talking about oh, neglected tropical diseases. We could get him back for something else if you'd like. He needs to have a better connection. <laughs> this is true. I want to request you guys do an episode about chronic malaria infection in children living in sub-Saharan Africa and the connection between Epstein-Barr virus and the high rate of pediatric Burkitt's lymphoma. This would be a great podcast because it combines parasitology and virology. I learned about yeah, this connection yeah, yeah. after having malaria myself after my trip and find it very interesting. Thank you both for your good work and for giving me such valuable information, which I can take back with me to South Sudan. Uh, truly, uh, truly, Tristan, if you're interested in seeing the page about my work, visit facebook.com slash... B E R A W E N Z A R A. Cool. Yeah, chronic malaria infection in children. We mentioned that today, didn't we? Sure, we, we sure did. But um, what's the connection with EBV and malaria? Is there any connection, or is this just. No, I know no, it's no. Connected I think, to I think that there but. is a connection. Um, but I would have to review the literature again to refresh my memory. Ah, that'd mean you'd have to do some work. I would have to do some work. To do <laughs> and all my brain cells are almost dead right now. I don't know where I'm going to find the room in my skull to accommodate the new knowledge, but we'll try. All right, here's one from Claire. You want to read another one, even though yeah, you say you sure. can't I, read? No, yeah. I, might, I might be able to work it out here. Don't break my computer. I'll try not Claire, to. can you see Claire? Yeah, I can see Claire. I can see clearly. <laughs> the rain is gone. That's right. Who sang that, by the way? I don't remember. Do you? I do, but I'll think of it. I can I, see we're clearly now the rain is on this gone. One. Uh, Dusty Springfield. No. I'll um, just type in the lyrics once you're done. Hi, Dixon and Vincent. I wrote to Twiv recently, but had also to write in here to tell you, to let you know that without your podcast, I would have been totally lost last month when I heard a series of talks on some of the more popular parasites, trips, leishmania, etc., I did know an amastic goat from a billy goat before starting <laughs> up with your podcasts. Thanks for the help, Claire in Seattle. That's a great name. <laughs> That's a good title. Uh, billy, from billy goats to amastic goats. I didn't know a <laughs> billy goat from an amastic goat. That's very funny. That's very funny. You want to have that as a title? Uh, not for this one, but we will think of a title for ours, I'm sure. I can see clearly now uh, was originally recorded, written and recorded by... Johnny Nash. But that's not the version that you and I are familiar with. Jimmy Cliff recorded a version, but that's not what I'm thinking no. about. I can see I don't think it's the same I can see clearly now. You know that the rain has gone? Yeah. Oh, here we go. The rain is gone. That's right. That one, it's also, huh. yeah, it's also Jimmy Cliff, okay. Johnny Nash, so apparently. Go. Well, then there you are then. I was thinking of someone else, but... Right. Anyway, next one is from Jim. Here's a link to a short story in our local daily press for the Norfolk area about a museum in Tokyo about parasites. Oh, yeah. I'm familiar Perhaps with that. it would provide Professor De Pommier a side trip one day when he's in that part <laughs> of the world. Yeah, I've heard of this museum. In fact, a friend of ours was stationed in Tokyo for a couple of years, and he went to this museum, and he sent me a little keychain 
with a trypanosome <laughs> on it. It's very nice. Couples that are getting married sometimes have their pictures taken next to tapeworms and Why? bell jars. Why would they do that? I have no idea. But if you went to the Google Images section of the internet and, and typed out Tokyo Museum of Parasites, you'll see a lot That's of those That's a cool pictures. museum. Yeah, it is. You have kind of a mini museum in your office. I there. do. I have a specimen museum. I do. Someday we'll have you uh, discuss what <laughs> each is on, on video. Uh, we could do that, I guess. I wish I could have the whole collection here because it was really Where's really the crazy. rest of it? I have no idea. Dixon. Was deacquisitioned by the university when we abandoned the laboratory portion of parasitic diseases to our second year medical students, regrettably. Suzanne writes I found lice in my seven year old's hair about a month ago. Really? My 11 year old had been asking me to check her hair for months. I could never find anything. Checking more closely with a lice comb revealed that she did uh, have them. Uh. A quick comb through my hair came up positive, too. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky for my husband, he keeps his head shaved. There you go. It was a funny thing I noticed, though. I had been taking a low dose of iron daily and can pretty easily tell when I'm eliminating the extra and ought to skip a day or two before it's being used up. As soon as we shampooed and combed out the lice, I stopped using all the iron. Remembering your comments on hookworm and anemia, I looked up lice and anemia. Huh. Google had links to a few cases where kids who were very infested showed up at doctors' offices or hospitals with severe anemia that had no other cause the doctors could find. This and the information about lice that mentioned some people have asymptomatic cases, evidently the itching is due to an allergy, not the bites, right. made me wonder just how long we had all been infested. I've had off and on times of slight iron deficiency since I was pregnant with my youngest and my oldest was in preschool. That's not too uncommon in women, and I'm healthy otherwise. This would be totally coincidental, I know, but it's making me wonder. I would love to know if anyone has studied how prevalent lice are in the U.S. I'm starting to suspect that prevalent. quite a few of us could carry them around in low numbers and not know for maybe years. It does seem like bed bugs that lice are turning up more at least around here in central Texas where the weather is barely even worth mentioning. It's summer, so it's hot, <laughs> right. seriously hot. But we've been getting more rain this year, so that's right. something. Right, Well, lice are more prevalent during the winter months, uh, surprisingly, because little kids that have had lice wear hats, and they mm. throw them all into a big pile when they go into their classroom, and when they get out, the lice have redistributed themselves among the kids' hats. So that's usually the way it uh, spreads from person to person. Do you know anything um, about the relationship of lice and iron? Nothing. We could ask Dr. Gwads. Let's ask Dr. Gwads. We should have a special section on our This Week in Parasitism show. Ask Dr. and then fill in that blank. And for questions about anemia, I would probably yield to Dr. Hotez because he's an expert on hookworm. Yeah, but we'll anemia. never – but he's so busy. We have to – Yeah. We'll yeah. never get him. Maybe a, a parasite doctor on call – Type well, you of know, thing. Dr. Sanjiv on have, the television. <laughs> we have a parasitologist uh, coming on the show in a couple of weeks. She's at the Mayo Clinic. Oh, right. Maybe she could answer this. Maybe. Uh, should maybe. We, can we remember? No. I will try. How will I remember? We will try. Save we will right try. here. Save for. Save uh, for. Yeah, that's right. All right. My kids had lice when they were young. Now, yep. no more. Nope. Everybody in school seemed to have it. Exactly. You want to read another one or you sure. just take a rest? No, no, I'll take. I'll read another one, or well, unless you'd like to. No, it's fine. Well, let me see. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the last one because we only have two more here. Fine. Peter writes, "Dear Twip Team, I thought this report from Lancet Infectious Diseases may be worth a mention. Evidence of schistosomiasis has previously been found in 5,200-year-old Egyptian mummies. That date has been pushed back a thousand years by the find of a flatworm egg in a grave at a Neolithic settlement site in northern Syria." What? Um, keep going. When Dixon says something, you have to pay attention. Well, it said flat worm. It didn't identify it specifically as a schistosomiasis. Prehistoric schistosomiasis parasite found in the Middle East. Oh, that's different. So it is an egg recovered from a pelvic sediment of a human individual dated 6,500 to 6,000 yeah. B.C. Hmm. Yeah, you know, people have been around for 200,000 years. Why are we so surprised? No, oh, it's cool to hey. find them, though. Piers Mitchell at the University of Cambridge and his colleagues examined sediment collected from beneath the pelvises of 26 skeletons, all between 6,500 and 6,000 year old. In one 6,200 year old sample, they found a 130 micrometer long flatworm egg that belonged to one of the species responsible for schistosomiasis. Nice. And he gives a couple of links to these sites. And we had a whole show about paleoparasitology, as I recall. Remember, we call it some creep. Crept into the crypt and crept. 
I do remember that, Dixon de yep. Palmier. Yep. And here's the last one from Rabbit, which I will let you right. read. Very good. Rabbit is Rich. <laughs> that was a series of books by John Updike, which is, I'm sure, not your era. Uh, it could have been. Um, Rabbit writes, I just started listening a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not caught up yet, but TWIP is the best science podcast I've found. And as uh, Norman Mailer would say, well, then just keep looking. You'll find it. And uh, that's so we were flattered, of course. It's so hard to find resources for laymen about parasites that aren't full of misinformation. I've been teaching myself about parasites for a while. I'm autistic, and they're one of my special interests. As is the case with many subjects, it's hard to find resources about parasites that appeal to an audience that's not made up of either experts or complete novices. It's easy to find very basic information, and it's not too difficult to find academic resources, but TWIP is by far the best resource I've found for my level of knowledge. Well, that's very nice of you to say. I have a question. I've read that cat owners aren't significantly more likely to be infected with Toxoplasma gondii than people who don't have cats. Is that true? And if so, why or how do you suppose that is? Well, the answer to that question uh, involves how do you acquire Toxoplasmosis to begin with? And the answer is mostly through the ingestion of raw or undercooked meat. And in Europe, it would be through the ingestion of lamb, because steak tartare in France is actually lamb tartare for the most part. Uh, and in the United States, it would be through the ingestion of raw hamburger meat or something akin to that. So uh, you're right. Cat owners um, are not any more heavily infected than people without cats. But the big risk for cats, of course, is not for the adult people. It's for the developing fetus in the mother. So if the cat infection spreads to the mother during her pregnancy, there is a big chance that the uter in utero infection in the fetus will also develop. And that is not without consequences in terms of the development of their central nervous system. As we also discussed in detail when uh, Dr. Boothroyd was one of our guests on this show. Ah, he was, wasn't he? he certainly was. See, Vincent, we have a lot of guests on our show. You just don't remember. Well, the thing at Dixon in a, in a podcast, it's yeah. not what you've done, I know but it's what you will do. What we <laughs> Once you've done an episode, it's so, over. But you know what? But you and can just do it again one, and again. <laughs> you can't do the same one over and over. No, you can't. But on an episodic th event like TWIP sure, and all sure, these podcasts, sure, sure. you have to keep producing. We have to water the plants in order for them to grow. Yes. And so as I long as you're this. around, you better keep helping me. Because without I'm, you, I can't do it. And without you, I wouldn't have even started this anyway. Yes, so here we are together. Stay healthy. Okay? Linked at the hips. Stay healthy and don't fish too much. I won't fish too much, but I'll fish enough. Because yeah. well, it's a seasonal I'm gonna do, activity. I'm gonna bring the bloody microphone up next to the stream. And Ooh, we can that would be great. There. No, 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 that would is be fantastic. Is it quiet enough? It's very quiet. The stream is quiet, right? Vincent, it's, it's, it's lovely. It's absolutely lovely. It's, <laughs> imagine yourself submerged up to your waist in water. You mean nice waist cool. deep? Waist you know, deep? Your waist could, deep. Could we go and you could point out all the parasites? I can't point out the parasites. No. Why? Because they're too small. Come on. Well, say where they might be. And oh, they might be. Can, How about the, the catfish parasite that <laughs> swims up your urethra? Stop. Would that be? The kanduru is not in the North America. Dixon, when you when you put your waders on, do you ever worry about that? <laughs> no. In fact, that's the protection. <laughs> <laughs> well, there might be a hole in it. <laughs> Now, I've never worried about that because I've never w waded in water. How long water. does it take to drive out to your fishing hole there? It's uh, 78 miles from New York City. Uh, it's not How too fast bad. can you drive? <laughs> I, got a, I got a gas guzzler. You do have a gas guzzler. I don't use those electric cars, you know. <laughs> Mine has a gas engine. Just a very small mm -hmm. gas engine. You can find TWIP at iTunes and microworld.org slash TWIP. If you like us, go over to iTunes and rate the show. We'd love that. We want more subscribers. Why? We do. We do. Because we want to teach the world about parasites. There you go. Now, I know there's this show called Monsters Inside Us, right? Yeah. And they're very popular. They are. Uh, we don't have their resources. We don't no. have producers and graphic artists and all of that. That's true. If we did, boy, we could make a show, <laughs> couldn't we, Dixon? Um, it would be a different show. Yeah. This is all about conversational learning. I believe that's right. If you have questions, we'd love to get them. Send them to twip at twiv.tv. Twip at twiv.tv. Right. 
You can find Dixon de Pommier, well, everywhere. <laughs> fishing. <laughs> fishing, urban ag. No, the only place w. you can't S. find him is because he's fishing. Trickinello.org, medicalecology.com, yeah. verticalfarm.com, yeah. and right here at Columbia University. Thank you, Dixon. My pleasure. I have a few more papers for TWIP, so we have, and then we have a We have a, a lot guest. in the pipeline. We have a guest who... Does a very interesting tw- uh, parasite blog, which right. we're going to bring on in the yep. next few weeks. Yep, yep. We, we we probably need to get some worm people on here too. We've had a lot of do you protozoans. Know, do you know worm people? I do know some worm people. I can tap I, into I, my I, vast sure. resources. Of yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music that you hear on TWIP is composed and performed. By Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.